So we are joined by our good friend Arnold, also known as Numata. Thanks for coming back on the show. No worries. So I invited you onto the show because you are a philosophy person and a religious studies person. Um, and we decided to talk about uh, this book, God is Red, um, by Vine Deloria Jr. Um, and this is part of a series of conversations that we kind of plan on having around uh, what we could call indigenous philosophy. If there is such a thing, this is something that we should debate. Um, and I think it's we're going to get into some of those discussions, you know, in this in this uh, text as well. Um, but before we start, I just kind of wanted to turn it over to you to maybe uh, just say um, a little bit about yourself. You've been on the show before, but uh, maybe if listeners haven't heard you, uh, you can just do an introduction. Sure. Imanaika Sangichek, Wagesni, Panasni, Nyogaksuti, and Nyogaksutiga, Mosok Hamutak, or New Amauta. Eh, Ayui, Ayuiga, Bolivia Manta, Collasuyu, or Collasuyu Manta, La Paz Manta, La Paz Mantapis, Cochapampa Mantapis. Hello, how are you all? Um, sisters, brothers, siblings. My name is New Amauta, um, and my family comes from Bolivia, or it's um, indigenous name of Collasuyu. Um, and my family comes from Cochabamba and La Paz, um, from a, the Quechua, from a Quechua speaking and an Aymara speaking region. Um, I identify as a Quechua Aymara, um, and uh, he, uh, I'm, I do a lot of philosophy, history, and politics on my social media. I know I'm a social media influencer. I shouldn't be on <laughs> back here over and over, but apparently I do good work. Uh, so. In the, uh, on those accounts, I basically do um, transnational indigenous history, politics, and philosophy. So everything from, um, like everything from the history of philosophy in Bolivia, um, like um, everything from like the um, the land based philosophies of the nineteen thirties, the nationalist movements of like the nineteen fifties and sixties, land reform, land back, uh, up to Evo Morales, or I've talked about like. Um, Emiliano Zapata, Comandante Ramona, and the Zapatista history of the 1900s in Mexico, or even like Iro there was one post where I made where I talked about Iroquois art in like the New York City subway, which um, is a nice tidbit for um, people who think indigenous peoples can't live in like can't create urban art or urban culture. Like indigenous peoples are just in the countryside, and there's a lot of instances of indigenous art in urban spaces, but. Neither here nor there. I'm here to speak about Vine Deloria Jr.'s "God Is Red" because it has much relevance. Because, as Nick and I agree, it has much relevance to the 21st century and indigenous movements currently. Yeah, and so I'll I'll start um, by introducing uh, the author, and then we we'll go into the text uh, itself. And for listeners who are interested in digging in more. Uh, well, first of all, let me just introduce myself because I don't introduce myself very often on this podcast. So, how many talk yapi? How many talk yapi? chante washte. I just greet all of you, you know, with a traditional Lakota greeting. Um, and actually, when we say how many it just means hello, relatives. And I think that actually speaks to uh, the the book itself and the the topic at hand. But also, it speaks to uh, I guess my personal relationship or my familiar relationship to the Deloria family, um, you know, they are, they are a proximity, uh, you know, their, their family's a proximity to ours in, in many ways, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, given, you know, Vine Deloria's uh, biography. He was born in uh, 1933 um, in Standing Rock, and he was enrolled in Standing Rock as well, but his family is actually Ihankdawa, um, which is Yankton. Um, and there's a really good book uh, that he has called Singing for His Spirit, where he talks about kind of his family legacy. Um, and suffice it to say, you know, he was actually born and raised a, in an Episcopalian family. Uh, and in fact, his father, Vine um, Delorio, actually knew my grandfather, uh, Andrew Estes, and they were actually um, both uh, my my grandfather wasn't a clergy necessarily, but he definitely was a lay reader and he was in the Episcopalian church. He was also a first language Lakota speaker. Um, and he also knew a lot about um, Lakota spirituality, 
and in fact, you know, um, was known to, uh, you know, assist in UEPs and other kind of ceremonies while also being kind of active in the church itself. And so I kind of think that a, a lot of Vine Deloria's um, personal background actually is very similar to mine. He grew up, you know, following his father around to these different convocations. Uh, he lived very much a political life. Um, he talks a little bit about it in, in, in this book a bit. Um, but I think it's you have to like remember that, you know, it, back in the day when he was kind of growing up in the in the 40s and the 50s, when he was traveling around with his father, his father was going to these various reservations. Um, and it was not a, a very kind of it was very hostile to uh, political organizing. Uh, and so one of the ways that Lakota, Dakota people of the Ocheti Shakoni organized is through the church. Um, because it was one of the only sanctioned ways. And the Episcopal Church um, was only the one of the few uh, sects of Christianity that allowed uh, its practitioners, especially indigenous people, to speak their language. Um, and so they would communicate at these convocations in Lakota, in the presence of, you know, their white Indian agents, other kind of white uh, missionaries, but they were actually organizing against termination legislation. Mm -hmm. So they're using the, the auspices of the church itself to actually uh, organize politically, you know. And so that was, you know, that was kind of a, like, that was kind of a, a cool factoid. And so I, I, I imagine, you know, Vine Deloria Jr. following around his father, Vine Deloria, kind of, you know, sitting at his, you know, sitting at his knee, so to speak, uh, listening to all these kind of uh, different, political leaders uh, around um, our, you know, our reservations and kind of growing up uh, with that in mind, but also being heavily influenced by Christianity in this, in this time period. Not to say that he didn't have an, uh, uh, like a, you know, a Lakota identity or Dakota identity, which he very much did. But nonetheless, I think um, that Christian influence really comes, comes to the fore in this book. Uh, and in fact, he went to, um, seminary school uh, after the marines you know um and he i think he was on his way to become you know a, a, a leader in the episcopalian church uh and then of course the red power movement happened um he became uh, an activist so to speak um becoming um the um becoming the uh, executive director of the national congress of american indians uh sort of in the fight against termination but also at this kind of new era, this new uh, consciousness in 1964 around, um, red, you know, what was what became coined as the Red Power Movement in 1966 by Clyde Warrior, you know, in conversation with Stokely Carmichael. And so, you know, thus begins his kind of political career. Uh, and then in 1969, he publishes a very famous text called Custer Died for Your Sins, which we've done an entire podcast on um, with Vine Deloria's son, uh, Phil Deloria. So you can go check that out. It's the hashtag Native Reads podcast. Um, but his, you know, his son talks about that book and its kind of its relevance today. And I, I feel like if you go back and read that book, um, it speaks to, uh, you know, the contemporary moment much in the same way that going back and reading this book, which I hadn't read uh, in, in, uh, since like 15 years ago. Um, but it's a lot of the things that he's talking about in this book, like speak to this particular moment in time. Um, but before we get into that, you know, um, I just want to say that, you know, Vindelor Jr., he's published widely. He's kind of considered the preeminent, uh, uh, you know, indigenous studies professor, intellectual of, of the Red Power Movement and beyond. You know, um, somebody once, you know, I, I, I've heard this multiple times, but people are like, who's going to be the next Vindelor Jr. of this generation? I don't know who that's going to be. I don't think there is another Vine Deloria Jr. <laughs> um, I think there can be many Vine Deloria Juniors or actually people just creating, you know, new kind of uh, new new work based on his work. But I would say, nonetheless, he like kind of kicked in the doors of the academy. And he's not necessarily a traditional academic, um, as you can, as you would, you know, tell by his, um, his writing style, you know, it's not very academic. He's very, um, you know, we were joking earlier before we hit record about some of the jokes that he makes, you know, he, it's the, the sort of, uh, the warm Indian humor very much comes, uh, you know, it's very evident on the page as you're reading this. And it's actually, it's a page turner. It's, it's an easy read, very different, um, than what we would consider like modern academic text uh, today. 
Um, but I do want to say that, you know, Vindelord Junior did pass away in 2005, um, having published, you know, dozens of books, um, most of which were seminal, you know, uh, works. Uh, and he himself has, you know, founded sort of like a, a like a, you know, a school of, th of thought that I, I don't think, um, you know, really is taken seriously. I think he was probably one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th century. Um, and, and, you know, for, for reasons we'll get into in this text. So I don't know if you want, if you have anything to add to that, uh, before I get into the kind of the historical context. I think it's super interesting that he has this in some ways, um, syncretist or hybrid, um, living experience as an indigenous person, because it's very relevant for a lot of indigenous peoples. I think actually in like, not just across like North America, but in Latin America, since my context is primarily the Andes, um, Peru, Boliv I'm Bolivian, but like Peru and Ecuador are very close countries culturally and geographically. Um, there's, there is the influence of Catholicism and the syncretism that exists, um, with between like Catholicism and the many indigenous deities and, in, um, um, uh, sites of worship that were, like introduced or taken in by Catholicism by force or otherwise. Um, so I, and even my own experience, um, surprisingly enough for, I always tell this to my friends as like, a, or at parties as like a shocker, but, um, I grew up Mormon surprisingly enough. So I already, so there's always that interesting understanding of when my grandma who converted, she had her own experience of, um, she she was the one who converted my family and she would also talk about how Jesus came from after he was crucified came to the Americas and taught indigenous peoples like civilized ways which was a very interesting way of thinking about how my own culture like my own in my own indigenous like reindigenization process of like trying to relearn my culture of that's such an interesting way to in some ways both take pride but also it be colonized because it the the point like oftentimes it's that jesus like the priests were the first ones to encounter christianity whereas in my grandmother in like mormon theology and in her own like reworkings of it too it was it was jesus himself who brought indigenous cultures they just degraded over time so i think that type of like hybrid indigenous um christian outlook um, is very important to note, but it's also very relevant, not just it's very relevant for a lot of people these days, and it creates very weird understandings of identity. But I think Vindeler, uh, Vindeler Jr. does a good job at like show making the critiques of Christianity in, in many of its values and why like they inevitably have led to um, the settler colonial conditions, uh, like um, structures that we have now. Yeah. And you know, for, for my personal background, actually, I was, you know, born and raised, I was baptized Catholic, born and raised Episcopalian. And in fact, I learned most of the language, the Lakota language that I know today, through the church itself. Um, and, you know, I was told by my uncle, the reason why we became Episcopalians is because um, it was, you know, one of the few, it was one of the only religions that would, Christian religions, denominations that would allow us to pray in our language. And so he was like, I'd rather, you know, um, I guess he said that my grandfather said that he would rather pray to, to you know, his God in his language, um, you know, uh, than to pray, you know, in, a, in, a, in English. And, you know, and then there was this other argument in our family that was like, well, now that we don't have to be underground anymore, we don't need the church anymore. And so there's kind of a, an abandonment. Some of my family still goes to the church, but others, you know, have kind of like you know, abandon the church, myself included. I'm not, I don't consider myself a Christian anymore. <laughs> Me either. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but yeah, so um, let's do a little bit of uh, historical context because yeah. in this, you know, and it's important to note for listeners and readers that we're reading the 30th anniversary edition, uh, which is bulkier. It's almost 300 pages long, um, but it was written, you know, this book was published uh, in 1973. And I think it actually came out um, during the Wounded Knee Massacre, or excuse me, during the Wounded Knee Occupation in, uh, that began at the end of February and ended in, in early May of 1973. And in fact, you know, this book wasn't as popular as um, Custer Died for Your Sins, even though, you know, it kind of had that bumper sticker slogan, like Custer Died for Your Sins, saying that God is red. And in fact, um, 
Leslie Marmon Soko, who is a Laguna writer, poet, you know, author, actually writes in the 30th anniversary edition, you know, that um, that God is actually God in Christianity uh, in the in the Christian sense you know, as she writes, is the root of the great weakness of the United States, mm. um, which she says is the inability to respect or tolerate others who are different. Um, but also, you know, Christianity was so weak uh, when it came to the United States that now God was dead or God is dead. And Indian said on a bumper sticker, quote, hey, God is red. She isn't dead, meaning she is alive and she being, you know, Mother Earth. And so I thought that was kind of a good way to explain, you know, what he he's he's kind of talking about in, in this book and why he chooses, you know, God is Red uh, as its as its title. And, you know, another kind of aspect of this is to think about the the context in which this book was published. It was published, you know, the year that the the Wounded Knee occupation happened uh, in in 1973. Um, it was at the kind of apotheosis, so to speak, or the pinnacle of the Red Power Movement, the militant Red Power Movement. Um, and so at, at this particular moment, indigenous people, and I'll use the word Indian just because he uses the word Indian. Yeah. Um, don't ever call me an Indian, but, <laughs> but we use this term behind closed doors. So I'm just going to use it uh, as a shorthand because he uses it. Um, he's, you know, Indians uh, as a people were trying to give voice to the concerns over getting lands back, you know? And so he's, he's using that terminology land back, uh, but thinking about it in a way that I think was very much ahead of its time, but he was, he was essentially, um, giving, he was giving the words, uh, you know, he was describing what, you know, uh, indigenous people at this particular moment in time uh, in the United States and Canada, you know, were trying to do. So, and it was an attempt, uh, as he says, as a as a quasi philosophical view of what the sacred uh, might mean to Indian people. Um, and so, there's you know there's in his mind there was a a quote you know quote unquote separation of the physical and spiritual worlds in in uh, in the kind of uh, you know the the Western uh, context. And so what happens is that. In during the Red Power movement, people saw Indians protesting, right? And but their their sort of vision or sort of the way that they saw these things unfold um, was very much governed by their inability to see other things. And I think like what he's saying here is that fundamentally that the Red Power movement was was more so a spiritual movement than it was um, what we would understand as a modern kind of social movement. And in fact, the American Indian movement often said, you know, that it, it was a, a spiritual movement. And so, you know, with that kind of, you know, with that kind of um, background, you know, there there's this argument or this contention that like the takeover of the BIA, which he uses as an example in 1972, at the end of the Trail of Broken Treaties, when, you know, the American Indian movement alongside other allies kind of came to uh, Washington, D.C. And, and demanded a meeting with Nixon um, you know, at the, at the, at, at the eve of his sort of reelection, um, they held a ceremony, so to speak, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs office. And people were like, how, you know, how do, how would you call the destruction of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, you know, office, a quote unquote ceremony. And so he be, kind of begins with this, like protest as an act of ceremony, which is kind of an interesting way to begin the book, you know, because he's like, well, this wasn't a novel idea. In fact, you know, 1964, 1965, there were fissions in the Northwest um, on the Nisqually River. And then, in, of course, in 1968, Canada demanded, uh, you know, the Mohawk people pay uh, tolls um, uh, on, on a, to cross a bridge to the United States, thus kind of violating their kind of traditional, you know, inherent rights to, to supersede uh, both Canada and the United States to dictate their movements across this artificial border, but also to access their own lands, you know. Uh, and then, of course, um, there was the takeover of Alcatraz in 1969, which happened because of, you know, this mass relocation effort of Native people off the reservation and into urban spaces, um, which were seen as, you know, quote unquote, categorically non-Indigenous or non-Indian spaces. 
And so it was a reassertion of presence. And in fact, um, he doesn't say this in the book, but in fact, I've read accounts of the initial takeover in 1969 and 1970 by the students. There were other occupations that preceded it. But the one that happened in 1969, there were actually Ohlone people uh, who were part of that initial occupation or reoccupation, I'd, I'd, I should say, and that were from indigenous from the Bay Area itself. And then, of course, you had the takeover of Fort Lawton, which was an abandoned uh, military base uh, north of Seattle, and the creation of the Daybreak Star Center as a result. Um, you had this kind of growing, you know, um, uh, re rec reclaiming of lands, occupation of Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, buildings, the occupation of Mount Rushmore um, by our people, the Lakota people, to reassert kind of control over the uh, Hesapo or the Black Hills uh, at this kind of historic site. But then you also have, and this is a really interesting kind of, um, you know, uh, feature of this. He doesn't really get into it much else in the book, but in the introduction, he talks a lot about how grave robbing and looting go part and parcel with the conquest of of the United States. And he kind of makes this Jungian ar argument, this idea, you know, of this kind of repressed uh, violence, um, you know, that, that goes hand in hand with like grave robbing that eventually manifests itself into actual killing of, of native people. Um, and he makes this argument, you know, he's, he, he uh, Vindler loves Carl Jung. I have never really read Carl Jung. I don't quite understand him. I know that Carl Jung had some weird dealings with the CIA, um, and that's and that's about it. Um, that's all I really know uh, about him. I, d I don't really care to know much more about him. But nonetheless, you know, um, Vindelory Jr. is very much influenced, you know, by him. And you know, he says he he writes quote the general attitude of whites, however, was that they were the true spiritual descendants of the of the original Indians. And that the contemporary Indians were foreigners who had no right to complain about their activities, meaning that the general attitude were, was that Indian, the Indian, uh, excuse me, the only Indians worth preserving were dead ones. Uh, and in fact, that white people were the true inheritors of the land. And he gives this example of how they were trying to build a, a highway through, you know, this place in Iowa. And they discovered, you know, a, a burial or a cemetery, actually. It wasn't just a burial ground. It was a cemetery. And I think there was, you know, like a half a dozen bodies that were found. Um, and six of them were categorically identified, quote unquote, as white. And one was suspected to be native. They didn't actually prove that this this body was indigenous. But the white bodies were reburied and reinterned at a cemetery. And the, the Indian body, you know, that was identified as Indian was actually put in a museum. Right. So it was kind of showing how, like, even in death, you know, there's uh, the, the, the sacredness or the sanctity of, of people to rest, you know, in peace is, you know, it, they don't have a right to it, even if they're buried, you know, because oftentimes archaeologists will make the, the claim that, oh, this happened so far in the past that it becomes a quote unquote commons or a common history or common kind of property that doesn't necessarily have rights. Well, this burial ground was actually it was a 19th century burial ground. It was an 18th century, 16th century or whatever. It was a recent burial. But because, you know, by virtue of the fact that that person being native, therefore they belong to, you know, a preservation um, element of, of the United States, which is, you know, a, a, um, a museum. Um, so the other, you know, this, this happened quite a bit. It still happens today. Actually, I, I just read a news article where... Um, uh, a, a museum in Glasgow, Scotland, um, was, uh, you know, ha had said it was going to give over, I think it was around uh, 50 different uh, items back to Lakota people. Many of those items um, came from uh, people looting the bodies of those who were killed at the Wounded Knee Massacre, you know, taking things such as like children's moccasins, uh, children's bonnets, necklaces, those kinds of things. Very grotesque, right? Um, but this is something that's often seen, you know, it goes part and parcel with identity, it goes part and parcel with spirituality and religion, uh, just like our lands, you know, our bodies, our religion and our spirituality are all also up for grabs um, for, uh, for white people. And today, it's like, now it's like our identities, you know, <laughs> we have a lot of people who are posing as native. Um, and just to kind of like, wrap this up really quick, you know, this, this really culminated in a kind of rising kind of militancy amongst specifically the American Indian movement, 
in you know taking over Wounded Knee in 1973. But what kind of marked it as as different as a departure from just um, you know what uh, we would consider kind of uh, I guess Christian you know led social movements and the civil rights movements. Um, was also the presence of you know uh, spiritual people such as you know the 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 Lakota chiefs or the, the traditional leaders and even in some instances medicine men like Frank Fools Crow or Leonard Crowduck who be, who sort of became the spiritual advisors and the spiritual leaders of the American Indian movement and in many ways the Red Power movement. But what he says though is that what separates uh, sort of the civil rights movement. Um, from the kind of red power or the power movements, as he calls them, in in the, the the late '60s and early '70s, is that the red power movement was specifically grounded in a religion that came from the land, whereas you know Christian kind of guided social movements and social justice projects introduced foreign concepts and foreign values um, that weren't necessarily from the land, and in fact shared the same sort of you know temple, so to speak, uh, as their adversaries. The white segregationists use Christianity as a way to justify, you know, uh, white supremacy, just as much as the, you know, the the Southern Christian leadership, you know, um, uh, leaders use Christianity as a way to uh, argue for the end of racial apartheid in the United States. And where kind of Indian religion is an outlier is that it's not. It's, it doesn't fall into, it doesn't share the same tent, so to speak, or the same teepee to use the humor, <laughs> the humor of Vine Deloria Jr. It doesn't share the same teepee as Christianity whatsoever, because it arises uh, specifically um, from, from this land. And it shows that history didn't end after an Indian massacre and that Indians themselves are not relics of the past, even though Christianity uh, and Western culture see uh, you know, Indian people as only belonging to a past and they don't see them as belonging to a present. And so what Vine Deloria is doing in this book is God is read is he's not trying to recuperate um, an idea of Indianness or indigeneity uh, that may or may not have existed in the past so much as he's trying to show how relevant and more relevant um, than Christianity, uh, Indian religion is to the present moment. And in fact, he makes the argument that Christianity you know, is in fact anachronistic because it didn't originate from this land. And so he's making a spatial, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but he's making a spatial argument of history versus a temporal argument, you know. Um, and so so with that, I'll, I'll, uh, that's kind of the, the historical context that he's writing. And of course, you know, a lot of these movements uh, led to certain, you know, reforms, um, such as the Indian Child Welfare Act, which repealed, ostensibly repealed, uh, Indian child removal, the taking of children from uh, Native families and the placement in, of them into boarding schools or foster care systems or white adoption uh, agencies, um, Christian adoption agencies, actually. A lot of Mormons actually stole a lot of Native children, too. Yeah. Um, but then also some things such as the 1978 uh, Indian uh, Religious Freedom Act, which ostensibly, you know, recognized uh indian religions as a legitimate religion but not necessarily you know ha didn't give it any teeth so so to speak in in um the court of law so um i don't know if you have any responses to that kind of brief historical up uh, con uh context of this book when it was written and why it was written yeah i think um i think there are three main points we can take from deloria he won he he places Christianity within a context um, that some, in some way he, he views it under indigenous categories and indigenous um, uh, and an indigenous lens, essentially saying indigenous peoples don't separate religion from politics in the traditional sense that they're both one in the same, that one's land is not just a material resource that we, that one would redistribute, but is one that has symbolism and sacredness and is literally it. Um, sacredness and will critique sacredness, um, but is symbolically and is symbolically and sanct is symbolically worthy and sanctified. But also, um, Christianity views itself as apart from philosophy, as apart from politics. And I think that's uh, and what Vine Deloria's critique on uh, shows is that Christianity itself is as much a political uh, is has as much its political aspects which delve into the colonial as it does its religious um, aspects. He also shows like 
and he also does reference the um the this is the second point the debate between Bartolome de las Casas um and Ginés de Sepúlveda which is a debate in 1550 um between Bartolome de las Casas who was saying that the Spanish empires um forced conversion of indigenous peoples by and I'll say indigenous peoples natives Indians they're they're all all those terms are colonial one way or another they're all imperfect um so I don't find a reason why one should be used over the other but as a side note but that that debate um which was called the debate at um uh, the Valla, uh, Valladolid debate specifically argued whether how indigenous people should be christianized Bartolome de las Casas wanted a an ethical slow uh more missionary uh, more common day missionary style we should convince indigenous peoples into christianity whereas Ginés de Sepúlveda was a was a staunch apologist for basically um, conversion by any means necessary. And that means conquest, war, and all uh, like outright genocide. But the question never arises, uh, should indigenous peoples be converted in the first place? It's uh, The question is already seeded to how it should be done, not whether or not it should be done. And it shows the real power of how indigenous peoples, of how claiming the inability for christianity to have a stable like stable foundation especially when critiqued by indigenous peoples is a very unique is a very unique one it's a third space that exists outside of like the uh, like um european context and that goes into the third um aspect that indigenous people uh, that in many ways indigenous religions and politics are able to critique the west from our own vantage points um and in some ways showing that indigenous religions and because of its spatial, um, it, uh, w- one of the main, uh, Vine Dolores uh, Jr.'s main thesis, uh, thesis is that indigenous religions are founded within, uh, are localized within a specific land. And because of that, there is not this obsession with trying to create a, an overarching truth by which everything that is explained, uh, that is that exists in the world must fit fit within that narrative. Rather, indigenous peoples are a lot more humble um, by saying this is the experience that we've had on our land, and it's not necessarily the experience that anyone else will have on their land or even on our own land. But there should be a sense of respect, uh, reciprocity, and especially and especially humility in that in that fact. Which, uh, when you see the civilizing mission of Christianity, um, it is a universalist religion. It's one that attempts to subsume all uh, all other forms of thought within it and i think that's the uniqueness of vine deloria's work is that he doesn't just reject christianity because it's colonial he dissects it. he dissects the specific parts um how it conceives of history how it places history within a um how it how modern christian scholars try to conceive of christianity within a scientific age and showing its weakness as well as showing the ways in which uh, Christian theology itself contradicts itself to the point where can we even trust it to create both um, stable philosophical as well as ethical foundations. Um, and I think that's one of the powers of indigenous critique, both um, then and uh, both then and now, that it does show that the West can be critiqued from the outside. And it's and I oftentimes I've been told in academia that that the West has its own methods of critiquing itself. There, um, because of all of the different debates, like Marxism and uh, liberal capitalism, uh, positivism, and the different like uh, reactions to it in the nineteen twenties and thirties, existentialism, phenomenology, like Christ- uh, the West, uh, Western philosophy has critiqued itself ad infinitum, but that's oftentimes used as an argument to say, well, in the, uh, well, there's no, there isn't necessarily the need for indigenous critique, whereas um, God is Red shows there there is and it can be very powerful and deloria is very shearing in that sense yeah and he's not just offering a critique he's actually saying that this is a viable alternative and it always has been it didn't just like it didn't just disappear and he kind of pokes fun at you know um liberals especially who like rediscover you know indigenous people like they you know they got they tired of uh, the civil rights movement, they tired of, you know, the militancy of, of black power. And then we became the answer. And there's like this, we, and he even talks about like that as kind of being a weakness of the, the Indian movement itself is that we weren't fully understood because 
on one hand, we were overly romanticized, you know, uh, to the point where it's like we became a solution um, just bec by sheer fact that they didn't understand us. Um, and so he's what he's he's saying is exactly what you're what you, you know, what you're saying is that it wasn't just a oh, well, you know, um, if we just use, you know, the the tools of uh, the colonizer, we can just deconstruct what they're saying. It's like, well, actually, these tools have been here you know, before the colonizer came and they still are here and they're very useful. And in fact, I would say that he isn't even, um, in some ways, I would say that he's not even providing an external critique. He's actually, I think, providing an internal critique of Western civilization and specifically of this um, philosophical foundation because he comes from it. You know, he's a trained seminary. He's like, he was citing people. I, I, I honestly, my eyes kind of glazed over because I was like, I don't, I've never read this person don't want to read them <laughs> but i've heard of paul tilling but i haven't read much of him <laughs> or I've oral not, yeah there's not the most exciting read protestant christianity in the <laughs> century yeah. but it, it is very interesting the way he critiques them like showing that they're on the ontological basis for how they conceive yeah. god and our relationship to in this case him are are flawed because in some ways they're already outside of the uh, outside of experience reality and in some ways the religious experience from which like God itself becomes a like becomes a valuable category, becomes a category in which um, in some ways the sanctified, the sacred um, can be um, are important rather than just being like in, that's why like both hippie like that's why the hippie movement sought out indigenous peoples. There was a closer connection to God, so mm. to say, that wasn't found in just repeating hymns at uh, like at church service and then eating hot dogs and thinking, is this really, is this really God? <laughs> We're all going to go watch football tomorrow or like in an hour. Yeah, no. And it, I think what he, like his kind of major critique too, and this is something that I, I wanted to talk about uh, is, is his idea of what he calls, you know, the spatial problem of history. And he's looking, and I think it's like a very, a very valuable critique and, and returning to it, it's very sophisticated. Um, and I don't, I don't know, like I was trying to, you know, as a historian, I was trying to like match up how you would actually, how we, how you would actually take this practice seriously in, in, in the practice of history. I mean, sure, I wrote a book, but I don't necessarily think I, I followed kind of his, his kind of formula of understanding how uh, spatial history, you know, contrasts to that of what he calls temporal history. And, you know, he kind of, he, he, I was thinking a little bit of, you know, on the lines of, you know, something like, you know, uh, Edward Said's traveling theory, where he's like, you know, this, but thinking about it in the context of religion, like how Christianity specifically, but there are other religions um, that often travel outside of the context from which they arise. Um, but he, you know, he's specifically interested in Christianity, but Christianity itself, you know, has this kind of monopoly of interpretation on time. Um, and that time, you know, because it's been unmoored, because Christianity has been unmoored from its uh, origin point, um, it has a really distorted view of history uh, because it sees chronological like history, the passing of time as the dominant form of how we experience time as human beings. Whereas Vine Deloria is saying, well, no, in fact, tribal peoples have for eons experienced time spatially. Uh, in the exact same ways that you're pointing out and that they found um, not just sacred sites, but, you know, have constructed homelands where emergence is a kind of uh, a singular, a singular event to the tribe, the tribe itself, but it's not necessarily a quote unquote universal event experienced by all, you know, people across time and, and space. Um, and it's like, it goes, it, it just reminds me of, that Zapatista phrase, uh, a world in which many worlds fit. And in fact, he, he has these, he kind of reconstructs these, uh, he reconstructs these interactions between Christian missionaries and, you know, spiritual leaders of, of tribes where a Christian missionary, you know, talks about how, um, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, humanity was created and how the, the world began in, in seven days, according to the Bible. And, you know, they, the, the religious leaders of the, the tribes kind of confer amongst themselves and then they explain how, you know, 
um, they are descendants of corn, they are of maize, you know, they're descendants of, of uh, you know, these, these plant beings or animal beings. And, you know, the, the priest gets, or the missionary gets really mad. And he's like, you know, he's like, how dare you? He's like, I told you the interpretation of truth. And you've, and you've just, you know, you've told me your superstitions. Like, why would you do that? And they, they like calmly, you know, look at him and they say, hey, man, calm down. Like, you know, you're not behaving in a manner of civility. Like, we've, we told you our truth. And it's like, you can accept both truths. You can accept multiple truths of, of the emergence of, of humanity. Why does it have to be a singular truth? And I think that's really what he's, you know, he's, um, he's getting at here. And I think that if we apply, you know, modern theories of settler colonialism, as we've come to understand them in the logic of elimination, I know that settler colonialism doesn't eliminate people, uh, native people, according to their religion, it doesn't just like target religion, you know, it's the primary mode of dispossession is to gain access to the land. But I do think that there are sort of theological or philosophical components to it to say, um, that it, you know, even liberalism itself is, is kind of a singular project. It's trying to create a homogenous uh, idea of, of humanity. And in doing so, it has to destroy, you know, it has to destroy tribal religions. It has to destroy indigenous religions to replace them with this kind of not just a, a, a religious monotheism, but even a secular monotheism of, of how um, history operates yeah. and according to this chronological you know time frame and i think like vine deloria is very correct in, in making this analysis he says this is just social you know darwinism this is essentially a social development theory that puts uh native people and tribal religions you know uh at the very beginning of, of humanity like they're primitive like these are primitive things and that eventually they would evolved into a monotheistic religion and so therefore like we are superior. There's a there's a racial project here, right? And so, I always it, it always like I always hesitate to say this, but it's always true. It seems like is that every every uh, Western project is always about race war. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, it's, there's a fear of talking about race, but then yeah. it's all about social, it's all about biological development. Yeah, <laughs> social progress. I think that's very true. Um, essentially, especially since like there are um actually to give a little bit of a case study because uh, like and i i hopefully i don't annoy too many people by always bringing it back to the andes but um it, interestingly enough a lot of uh, like a lot of anthropologists in the 70s realized much or made studies about andean messianism and many of the chroniclers who wrote like mestizo chroniclers so they're mixed between like the inca nobility and spanish conquistadors following the fall of the inca empire and many of them try when they wrote their text to the king of Spain about why Spanish colonialism must accept indigenous peoples and give a more ethical order. It wasn't about decolonization. It was more about like give us more of a slice of the pie, um, which in the 15, which in the 15, 1600s was um, as much as you could get at that time. Sadly, many of these chroniclers like Felipe Huamampo Madayala said, well, when Adam and Eve started, then you had no uh, um, that's the beginning of humanity. Then you had Noah and the flood. And that's where, and after that, humanity starts separating itself off. Then you have the ink, then you have the, the Christian version of history with, um, with Solomon and Jesus and then onward. And then you have um, Manco Capac and, or the four ages of the Inca empire starting with like Purun Runa, Wari Runa. So you have like this, this temporal concept actually existed can be seen very directly in the Inca period or like uh, with the Inca chroniclers who say, well, without Christian, without the Christian myth, there would be no Inca humanity in the first place. Um, that in some ways, these writers had to write themselves into Christian history to be seen as valid, but already the question that because Christian history is already universal, whereas these histories are in some ways local, but to be able to gain any access to the colonial, uh, to any colonial benefit or to at least a reduced sentence under colonialism, you had to, in some ways, attribute yourself as rational under uh, the Christian doctrine. And in some ways, uh, there's another one named Elinka Garcilas de la Vega who wrote, the culmination of the Inca religion was with the arrival of the, of the Catholics who brought in abstract concepts of um, religion, which 
did not exist in the uh, uh, with the Incas with the Quechua Naimara because there was a worship of the land and of specific local deity. So in so in these two like uh, literary cases, we can see how like that temporal uh, that temporal history attempts to subsume other for like other localized religions as a way to both uh, and in many ways the colonized try to work within that uh, within that framework but already seeding the question of rather how should we separate ourselves from Christianity it's not that's not the question the question is how do we exist within Christianity um, within this universal project and I think the goal of Delore is that th- that question that question should be posed how do we escape uh, mm. that universal concept uh, the universalism of Christianity how do we go back to a uh, a land-based history, which is difficult because he does uh, one of the problems that, oh, well, not problems, but one of the difficulties that I found coming from more of an academic um, standpoint was the myth, uh, the view of mythology as and storytelling as history, because it can be very, it can be very powerful and it's very moving. Like it's very, like um, mo- in some ways, storytelling and myths in their modern incarnation could be like movies. But in many ways, the emphasis is on the symbolism and on the um, what is viewed as important, not on the chronology. So of Deloria ta- as, talks about how in certain store in certain indigenous stories, you'll have um, you'll have like thousands of years condensed into what seems like two, three sentences because not, not much happened. For, um, but then you have um, like a culture, uh, a culture hero who comes up. And then you have like paragraphs upon paragraphs or like minutes upon minutes of like um, interpretation of this person, even though this hero might have like existed maybe 100 years if we're if it's a human, if it's a human person. So you have so that becomes difficult for creating like um, like history as we would conceive it now, Um, because our because as you know, you're a historian. It's very dependent on like dates on the archival record, which. Uh, you want to, in some ways, explain f- from order to order, which in myths doesn't happen often. Um, so there's always that conflict now also for us, because going back to the spatial view of history that um, the important, like whatever is local is important and how we explain that is based on what we find important, not based on time, creates uh, creates a question of, how do we write history at that point? And I don't think, mm-hmm. and that question hasn't been resolved yet. And I think it'd be an interesting one if someone could attempt it. Yeah, no, that's. I mean, I think what you bring up is really, really important. And I think you know, on on one hand, he's trying to. I think his goal is to actually provincialize um, Christianity, and to and to say that it's like Christianity will come in, uh, even in these kind of more progressive movements, and try to like uh, moments, I should say, and try to like incorporate elements of indigeneity or indigenous religions or practices to but all that does is really just confirm it as kind of the universal you know religion um and then it just becomes like window dressing essentially you know like when i was talking about um and i would say that probably episcopalian church is one of the more progressive churches (laughs) that have colonized us uh but nonetheless it you know at that time period it was just using it was just like adding and you know it's putting a feather in the hat of colonization (laughs) essentially um and I just want to read this passage uh, yeah. from, he quotes uh, L- uh, Luther Standing Bear um, when talking about kind of the profound alienation that uh, white people will always feel, white settlers will always feel in this land, uh, even even as they try to create, you know, fabricate country, fabricate nation, fabricate patriotism, because their patriotism and their allegiance is to something that's, it's fake, you know, and he talks about why, um, why that's a problem, you know, that's going to be the, the, the kind of moral crisis of, of this nation, you know, from the get-go. He writes, the white man does not understand America. He is too far removed from its formative processes. The roots of the tree of his life have not yet grasped the rock and soil. The white man is still troubled by primitive fears. He still has in his consciousness the perils of this frontier continent. Some of, the fat, some of its fastness... Uh, not yet having yielded to his questioning footsteps and inquiring eyes. He shudders still with the memory of the lost of his forefathers upon its scorching deserts and forbidden mountaintops. 
The man from Europe is still a foreigner and an alien, and he still hates the man who questioned his oath across the continent. But in the Indian, the spirit of the land is still vested. It will be until other men are able to divine and meet its rhythm. Men must be born and reborn to belong. Their bodies must be formed of the dust of their forefathers' bones. And in here, it's, you know, he he's like, I like this book because, um, you know, he's taking like, Luther Standing Bear wrote that in like the 30s. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like in the 70s, it wasn't in the 80s. But basically, he's, you know, he's, I think that's always going to be the biggest fear. And this is, you know, one of the biggest fears of not just a, a religious fear, but I think a political fear of our, of our, con- our contemporary moment is that whiteness as we know it today, as it's constructed in the United States, is a, is a fear-based identity, right? You know, I just watched a video of a white police officer who pulled over a, a black man in Michigan and he shot him and he was completely unarmed, you know, because he was operating fundamentally out of, out of fear that he was somehow going to be destroyed um, by this black person. And if you read the Declaration of Independence, the founding of this country, it talks about the fear of black people through, you know, slave revolts or, uh, you know, the merciless savage Indians on the frontier, right? The Great Replacement is one of the governing ideologies of, of whiteness. And I think it's also, you know, like I said at the beginning of this uh, podcast episode, it's the great weakness uh, of America and it's the great weakness of Christianity. Um, because in the context of the United States, it might be different elsewhere, but in the context of the United States, Christianity is fundamentally, you know, uh, linked to settler colonialism and, you know, the colonization of, of, of these lands. And it goes hand in hand with the destruction of, of native cultures. Um, and to kind of, you know, kind of put a, uh, an end on this conversation, on this particular conversation, it's important to point out that at the turn of the century, the 19th century to the 20th century, the United States implemented um, what were considered, you know, which, which were called uh, civilization regulations um, that meant that dancing, you know, certain like language and ceremonial practices such as giveaways or the keeping of the spirit um, were fundamentally banned and created a court of Indian offenses to essentially charge out medicine men um, and, and women too, uh, for that matter. Um, and he doesn't talk about this, you know, in this book, this is kind of one of the oversights, you know, not just of him, but of, of people of this generation, but there was also created the Canton insane asylum for Indians in South Dakota, which specific was the only Indian asylum of its kind, I think in the hemisphere, to be honest, actually maybe in the world. Um, and they would go out and specifically target, uh, what they considered to be you know, religious people, religious leaders in uh, various nation, uh, various nations, specifically in the Northern Plains. Some came from Navajo and the in the Southwest region, but they would send them there. And nine out of ten people who were sent to the Canton Insane Asylum died there, right? And they would also target those who were, who were considered sexually deviant, uh, meaning those those who were not, you know, didn't fall in sort of the gender binary, or you know, weren't heteronormative. Um, so they would target uh, these people as well and to destroy them. And, you know, this is a question, you know, that he doesn't answer in this book that I, but that I have as well, because it is fundamental to a lot of our religions and spiritual practices. You know, the notion of a two spirited person or the notion of somebody who who possesses a spiritual significance or a connection because of not just their gender identity, um, but what we would call in modern parlance, you know, their quote unquote queerness, right? Or they're, they're uh, falling outside of these kind of traditional gender norms. Um, that was something that, I, you know, I had in, uh, kind of a question about, but I don't know if we can answer that here, but just thinking about how Christianity um, is part and parcel to kind of heteronormativity as well. And it is fundamentally about taking the land uh, and the consequences of taking the land are, you know, the subversion of uh, political authority of, of indigenous women and women in general, the, dis- the annihilation of queer two-spirited people, uh, and the creation of a, you know, a heteronuclear family. I mean, that goes all into these already preconceived notions within Christianity of what it means to be human and the, uh, the Manichaean divides between like man and woman that must be that are always opposite between man and nature the 
between the Christian, the good Christian and the evil outsider, the other, the savage, the slave. And in many ways that, um, that type of Manichaean like belief goes into two of the greatest fears of, um, of, of like Christianity, which is like death and, um, and nature. Um, I think we'll, it, like one thing that I found interesting and I, and we'll come back to the question of heteronormativity because that goes into like how like, um, the human concept of uh, like the concept of the human was developed, but um, cr- the Christian fear of death in many ways is contradictory. If you have like this concept of the afterlife, why have a fear if the afterlife is in some ways better than, um, um, than this life? Um, rather, uh, and when there's that, con- uh, when it seems to be apparent that like that should be welcome, it seems to be the opposite because there's this like massive fear of, of, of dying and of being ki- and of being killed off, I think. And there's this interesting line. Um, uh, when I find it, I, I think it was um, very enlightening. But he talked. Uh, well, essentially, Deloria was trying to explain that um, that death, in many ways, was the destruction of one's identity and one's identity, but like the destruction of both the body meant also the destruction of the soul. And that in some ways, and but there's also the idea that like that type of, um, if the temporal, uh, like, if the Christian is destroyed, and the thus it also means that the soul of the nation, the the project that is being built, will also be destroyed, um, and that it no longer becomes one of just, um, my own individual death, but there's also this type of civiliz- uh, civilizational war, this like. Uh, this war, the class of civilization that you would have, like with like Huntington, um, but this is taken on a metaphysical level because now it's um, the two concepts of the the historical and the spa- uh, the the temporal and the spatial fighting it out. But you have also this type of view that like that nature itself is something that must be tamed, that it is uh, because of its otherness it must be brought within history itself. And this is done through uh, that that is done through industrialization, but you also see like uh, that is done through industrialization. Whereas um, with indigenous peoples, there is the view that death itself is not something that death itself is not outside of what is good, but is rather the natural inevitable process of just living. And there is a and there is a um, kill with chief that um, Deloria cites where he says. Where an India, where um, a Kiowa chief is about to die after being taken a prisoner in Texas, and he sings this um, death chant, and he says, "Oh, son, you remain forever, but we, Kaits- uh, Kaitsenko, must die. Oh, Earth, you remain forever, but we, Kaitsenko, must die." Now that could be seen as very somber and very uh, saddening, which it is, but it also shows the values that Delores is trying to explain, that death uh, that indigenous religions have a specific emphasis on uh, a specific ontological emphasis of indigenous peoples are part of nature and to escape that is to in and to escape that in some ways is to live in irreality this some way in some ways these types of religious views preempt um, concepts such as existentialism of viewing your of viewing the inevitability of one's own death as part of uh, one's own create of one's own creation um, but he also, but it also shows that one va- uh, one values and creates one's own worth, not through the individual self, but through what Delores says through external, more eternal um, structures, the earth, the sun, which will remain. And if those will remain, then why is there a fear? Uh, then one's own death is a small speck within like the grand scheme of things. Is that concept that you see, like that you probably will see, uh, like Facebook, like you see how big the universe is, like um, like how small you are. The Earth is like one to uh, one trillionth of the size of like the entire galaxy, and then you have to count the universe. That's the West's attempt to try to reach that point, which indigenous peoples are, have already done through through the tribe, uh, through community, through the tribal uh, rituals and ethic that have been like sewed in for centuries, that uh, millennia. Which Christianity, which after, which is starting to be questioned both in the seventies and now, but to no avail, and I think that's probably and that's probably one of the reasons why you also do have this type of um, 
this type of nihilism that's coming about in 21st century too, which this, which is why I think Deloria wor- Deloria's work is very important. It shows that Christianity, yeah, like he might not say it specifically in these terms, but there is a certain nihilism that's coming out from the failures of Christianity to resolve the experience of uh, to uh, resolve its own contradictions. This fear of uh, this fear, like God is sacred, but the earth, um, the earth and nature is not. One's own, um, heaven is uh, heaven is beautiful. It's either um, a holy court of angels or it's like um, he says um, jokingly, like it's just suburbia, but with like all of the bad parts out of it. But also still having that fear of death and that inability to resolve that contradiction in some ways creates that nihilism that we can see in like white supremacist violence. The um, the like um, especially with like eco terror uh, with um, white supremacist eco terrorism. Like, oh, we must destroy the wrong races to save the earth. Uh, when it's the, when the problem is that Western culture itself has already deemed nature as evil. And also, the only way that nature can be tamed is if we have the right stewardship of the land. Not, um, whereas Deloria says, the problem isn't how we control it. It's how do we let go of that control so that we can be um, go into these natural cycles how can we affirm the life not just of ourselves but of all of the other um, beings larger and smaller um, outside of us yeah and you know just to kind of build on that point he he makes this strong argument against uh, the idea of original sin and how you know adam and eve you know well uh, he doesn't he doesn't say this in the book but it's like you know adam is basically corrupted by the sins of of eve essentially you know, uh, um, for eating the apple and all this and the snake. Um, but he makes this argument to go back kind of the spatial theory of history. He's like, well, where did that happen? You know, like where was, where was the garden of Eden, you know, and you, you can ask a Christian today and they'll be like, Oh, Mesopotamia, you know, they don't, they don't know. Yeah. Right. They don't have an idea of where these events took place. Uh, and he makes this argument that how unmoored Christian history is to, actual history on this physical plane and i think he actually makes a strong argument here to say that indian religions are much more materialist and grounded in reality uh because they can point to oh you know the uh, you know this history you know at this river this is what happened here and this is why it happened you know uh, we don't know when it happened but we know that it happened here <laughs> whereas christianity can't say like you know it can't open its its book, you know, its its uh, primary book, and and say like this happened here and this is why it happened. You know, it's it's kind of been mythologized to a, to the point of complete abstraction. Yeah, which uh, is why much... you have like which is why you have like priests always saying the end of the uh, the end of times is coming on like <laughs> May May fourteenth, twenty twenty. Like, if, yeah. let's see if that's real, but like, yeah. um, that type of spatial reasoning, like. Um, everything is within the book. You have to abstract real. You have to abstract reality, and then cut off the, um, cut it in like cookie cutter it into the biblical narrative, and then you always have those failures of like, well, I must have interpreted the date wrong, rather than think, well, maybe the world, uh, maybe the world is more complex than what the Bible is actually saying. Yeah, and I mean, even the notion of death, I think, is is like you know, you're you're talking about this and and the idea of sin. It's like he doesn't talk about the concept of hell. Um, so much but it's like you ask like a christian and like what heaven is like and there might be a definitive definitive answer but i was just thinking about this like as you're talking i was like i actually don't know nobody's ever described to me like from an indian like from our from lakota point of view what heaven is we don't i don't like in fact we don't even i was like i don't think we because somebody asked me that once i was like i don't i don't really know like if they're like what heaven is, you know, like there's kind of these vague concepts of like the Milky Way, you know, the Chunku Wanagi, the, the spirit road and everything like that. But it's not like clearly defined about like, you'll see this and this. And it, it's partly because um, that world, the other side actually coexists with the physical world, uh, you know, in the ceremonies itself. It's not, there's no, you know, separation, uh, so to speak. And I think that's really what he's talking about. It's like, you know even and he goes into you know he goes into this argument and i think it's actually i think there's truth to this where he talks about there is a science to indian religion um there's a reason why rituals are performed a certain way and it's not just for some kind of uh intangible you know outcome or whatever psychosis even though that's or a psychological benefit even though that's part of it Um, but in fact it's like 
you know, if you think about the ingenuity of indigenous cultures in the Western Hemisphere, you know, 40% of the foods that you eat on a daily basis are from this hemisphere. Corn, maize being, you know, the number one, and it has a sacred origin, you know, and by sacred, I don't mean like a, like a mythological origin, but it's human humanity has had a relationship. He uses the, the idea of, of wheat, which I'm like, I'm like, fine, like, come on, bro, like, read some, read some, read some literature below the, the US Mexico border, you know, yeah. um, especially when it comes to corn, because that plant would not exist without human cultivation. You know, and without domestication, it can't like the wheat, like the wheat, the he, he talks about for bread being unable to repopulate itself, you know, naturally or without human intervention. Corn is the exact same way. And so it's like, what is that relationship? You know, how did that originate? And there isn't one origin story to that. Right. There's multiple origin stories. You'll talk to, you know, uh, Pueblo people in the Southwest, and they'll have an origin story. We have an origin story, actually, uh, of where corn came from, you know, from a Lakota, there's actually several origin stories of where Lakota cor uh, corn came from, uh, for Lakota people. And so it's it, like, that's a fascinating thing, too, is that even our origins, it's not just a, a singular origin of humans were created, and therefore history started, but it was like, our humanity um, was fundamentally defined in relationship to the creation of like something like maize, or even for us, we say teoyate, that's interchangeable with Lakota people and the actual Buffalo nations that exist as well. And so when we talk about sovereignty, when we talk about treaties, and he talks about this in here, it's like in some, some of the instances, these leaders, when they're signing treaties, uh, with the United States government, they're like, I don't have any authority to speak on behalf of, you know, the animal nations or the land itself. Like, what does the land actually say? And they think it's like, oh, this rhetorical device or whatever. It's, you know, it's a romanticism. But in fact, you know, the covenant of treaty making and agreements oftentimes included actually, almost, I, I don't know if, if it ever did not include, maybe from Lakota perspective, the non-human world, right? It always has included the non-human world. But within kind of the legal canon, which is, you know, uh, derived specifically from Western Christianity, those things don't have rights. Islam, they have rights. That's a whole nother question. But, but uh, in Christianity, they, they don't have rights. They're not, con they're considered uh, inferior to human beings. Um, so, you know, that was, that was something that I felt like he, he was on to something in terms of like indigenous science. And I think what happens, um, sadly is that people try to like map science onto indigeneity and try to find common grounds much like they would try to do with like you know he's arguing against in terms of finding like similarities between you know tribal religions and christian religions he said you know they're they're so we should actually focus on differences and not similarities but nonetheless they're both religions and i would say that that's actually like you know, he's onto something in terms of saying that about indigenous science. And I was just thinking back to some, you know, previous episode that we had with Jessica Hernandez, you know, looking at uh, indigenous science from a Mayan perspective, you know, and, and how, um, you know, these experiential kind of like, pri you know, prioritizing experience versus prioritizing abstract concepts and processes is fundamental to, you know, indigenous science, whereas, you know, the latter seems to be fundamental to to western science to you know how many times i don't know if you've ever heard of this but science is constantly trying to create and find a grand unifying theory yeah. which in my mind is like it's some it's like repurposing the god narrative you know uh that there's one god you know that that kind of began everything um and why can't there be multiple origins you know why can't there be multiple beginnings of times and matter and space you know in many ways, like a lot of these um, and it's, it's the same case with um, philosophies too. a lot of the languages, um, terms that are used even within like Western philosophy are just metaphors for like a similar uh, for the same concept, like the divine, the sacred God. They're all like different metaphors for a type of experience that is trying to be pointed at directly, but is always being abstracted. Um, but yeah, I think what sci like um, in terms of indigenous science, there should be that type of humility, like with traditional ecological knowledge, even like the U.S. government is trying to is recognizing, well, maybe maybe the Indians had something right. Like, um, but even though it is uh, even though there will be a, a certain type of um, there will be a, 
a certain certain type of so to say weakness to a u.s uh, a u.s um sanctioned traditional ecological knowledge <laughs> there is a there's always that certain type of there's that certain sense that indigenous experience and recordings of phenomena are not themselves because of the way that they're, they're done through like storytelling and mythology are not in and of themselves now um illegitimate which i think is one of the things that ha- even a lot of native scholars that a lot of native scholars are also trying to do is try to get out of this uh try to understand the that even though western uh, western philosophy and history can be uh, is true but indigenous stories are themselves true through their uh, through the own their own mechanisms and narratives we just have to be uh, humble to the truth that they're trying to explain without like the numbers that they're putting in like that are inherent but aren't being said um i want to move on to the um the question of land though like um how in some ways vine uh, deloria makes a very specific question about how like land itself has a power over us and has a power over how culture is created and he also taught and he also makes a very very strange um very interesting claim and it, it as you said it comes from a like a jungian perspective but he says um that christianity when it still starts faltering leads itself to um leads itself to this quote in uh, to some traditional and pre like pre-christian views of like the land and like uh and pre-christian religions um he talks about how um, in England, there appears to be the phenomenon of ghosts, um, and there's this type of um, fascination with ghosts in England, or how in Mexico, even with Christianity and the and the Holy Mother of Guadalupe, La Virgen de Guadalupe, she appears on top of the hill of Tepeyac, which itself was already a sacred site for Tonant for like the Aztec Mexica god Tonan goddess Tonantzin or our Holy Mother. But he also says that there is a very specific, and this is on page 145, but there's also a very, there's a dark side to this return too, because he cites, um, I, I don't know if you, if I can say the actual word in terms of, um, I don't know if it'll like demonetize on Spotify or something, um, but like national socialism, basically like 1930s Germany, that there was a type of like Teutonic return to like the pagan roots of Germany. And that because of that, uh, and that this was because Christianity in many ways was being questioned and had failed to um, meet the needs of the German people. So, and in many ways, there's that, there's that problem, uh, there's that problem where like the land has, yes, power over culture in indigenous, um, in indigenous philosophies. It even exists in Bolivia too, that the mountain, that Mount Ilimani will be the source of rationality and philosophy or in the, has been the source of rationality and philosophy because of its grandeur, because of its effect, um, um, effect, or uh, uh, because of how it sta- uh, how it like se- is the centerpiece within the landscape. But then you also have the other narrative of blood and soil, which we also want to avoid. So I think it's also interesting, like Deloria saying, yeah, the Nazis also had this idea, but we shouldn't somehow, oh, we shouldn't somehow like give it all together we should understand how that type of nihilism that came out in germany is itself a degraded form of trying to return of trying to quote return to indigeneity in this case in a european context one in which europe tried to colonize itself yeah i want to that's in my critique section because i wanted to like talk about european indigeneity uh, because he he gestures to it multiple times like the return of jew jew druidism or druidic yeah, druid, practices yeah. and paganism all that other stuff um but i want to yeah i, I want to build on that a little bit because you know i think like throughout this text he's really trying to um in many ways like it's like it's kind of weird because he's working he's working on on two kind of registers one is he's he's trying to say that indian religions are old you know as old as the land itself so to speak since time immemorial but at the same time he's saying that there's something actually new about this moment in time with the revitalization of indian religions which had been you know suppressed that we talked about earlier um and and an attempt to like rediscover so to speak uh indian religions by indians themselves and non-indian people 
and how do we make sense of this particular moment in time? And I think he, he comes up uh, with several kind of theses of what Indian religion or what religion should be in the context of, you know, the Americas, right? And he, he writes on page 146, it's kind of right after um, the quote that you just read, religions must not be simple expressions of ethical and moral codes as we have been taught. And, you know, he's, he, he kind of really rails against this idea of, of morality and, and ethics um, as abstract ideas, you know, that don't really match the material reality that we live in all the time. Yeah. Quote, they must be more complicated manifestations of the living earth itself. And this aspect of religion is something that American Indians of all people on earth represented. And he makes the argument that, you know, uh, further down that, you know, that American Indian identity is so strong as to be virtually indistinguishable from the earth itself. Yeah. You know, again, let's avoid the uh, conflation of blood and soil. Here. Yeah. And I think that also we ha like there is the liberal concept of fascism, like, oh, it's somehow like uh, it's somehow this type of concept of um, we uh, return like this return to uh, this return right. to tradition which in some ways can be quite bad if you have like um the uh, this ultra fascistic like christianity that a lot of um uh, fascists have uh, done like in like Fr francisco franco in spain or um i'm not sure if um mussolini tried um even though he did um in some ways want to return to the Ro old roman empire but mm -hmm. many fascist leaders uh, in europe wanted a type of ultra nationalist christianity and I think that's the same case in the U.S. now. This type of um, the uh, this narrative that like we need to return to Christian values, and but like the uh, certain uh, only the right Christian values, not the ones that the immigrants want, or or not the ones that are trying to be progressive. Only the ones that fit within the settler colonial project of the nation state, or and in some ways like um, there's also I've also heard the idea of like homo nationalism, that mm. in some ways um. There are there are like queer folks who I think play into the fear of um of like um what of POCs and then like white uh white queer folks revert to nationalism to protect themselves from that without realizing that like indigenous peoples and other and like non Western cultures have had forms of queerness from time immemorial and they're not the danger um just to kind of fuse the two together in some ways like um much much of the spatial narrative like much of the um temporal narrative is trying to erase queer folks uh, uh much of the temporal narrative of christianity removes much of the queerness that existed within um indigenous religions like um changing woman who created the um the two spirit children in the creation myth of the dine or the kariwarmi the two spirits in the um with uh within the jaguar uh, what is it the, i believe the jaguar deity that existed within the inca empire that these are somehow outside of that these have to be either outside of history or they're pagan aberrations that will be overcome um and i think the christian narrative now uh, the nationalist narrative you have in the u.s in some ways wants to do that blood and soil all of the queerness that uh, queer and trans folks now are just aberrations that must be mm -hmm. overcome to complete the um, America's true essence or like the U.S.'s true essence. 